Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and um, welcome to the session dedicated to the Inspire thematic clusters. My name is Robert Thomas, and I'm the, the commission coordinator of this activity. First of all, let me ask you about uh, whether you know this thematic cluster platform. Who of you haven't been there yet? So, I was maybe not so clear. So, who, all of you knows the platform? Somebody not? Great. So, I can be very fast with the initial slides. The organization of the session will be that I will give you the overview of the activity. Uh, then I will share with you some uh, <clears throat> uh, news about a new platform that we are developing now. And then, you know, I will give a floor to each of the nine facilitators that will give you some flash interesting information from their clusters. So, so, and of course then, hopefully we will have some time for discussions because this is, this is the community platform, so the main purpose is really to share. So we would like to present to you something, but of course we would be very pleased if you give us some feedback because that's, that's, that's the fundamental thing. Okay, so the collaborative platform was launched in uh, December 2014, so it's almost four years. Uh, it's been always embedded in the official maintenance and implementation working plan for Inspire. At the beginning as an action 14 and now as an action 2016.4. So it's an official activity that is coordinated by the Commission, but it's a community platform. So stop, you know, formalism. It's really a community platform that should be used uh, by Inspire implementers and people that are interested in Inspire to share their experience, to provide the good practices, ask questions, and hopefully uh, uh, people would answer, would react to this. So the main function of the collaboration platform is the, uh, to share, to, you know, to, 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 to function as a knowledge base. It's been already four years, so it's a knowledge base of implementation examples, implementation issues, discussion. So really, I would recommend those that are newcomers to inspire implementation, you know, to go there and to try to find, find the, some suggestions there. And I'm sure you, 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 will, you will succeed. Um, It's also part of the Inspire website. We call it Knowledge Base. So you can, you can go directly from the Inspire official Inspire website to the thematic cluster platform, as it's shown in the picture. Um, yeah. So how it's organized? So there are currently nine clusters that are basically aggregate, aggregation of the communities based on the Inspire data teams. So you can also see it as a kind of a follow-up of the thematic working groups that were responsible for drafting the, the data specification in the time of, of the work on the implementing rules for interoperability. So 2000, let's say, uh, 9 to 2014. So here is the list of people that are responsible for facilitating the discussions, trying to find uh, conclusions, and uh, really stimulating, stimulating the activity. As you can see, we have facilitators as well. We have the MIGT liaison. So these are the kind of a represent, technical representatives of the member states that are um, nominated inside the uh, official Inspire maintenance and implementation group. So a little bit of statistics. So currently there are 940 registered members. So the platform is free, you don't need to register at all. If you want to look for information, if you want to uh, find things, etc. But of course, if you want to react to the discussion, if you want to post question, if you want to post uh, your good practice, for instance, then you have to register. The registration is done through the European ECA system. So maybe you know it, you 
you have it already because of uh, European projects, etc., that are using the same system. Okay, so as you can see, we have already, we have roughly 670 discussion topics there, almost 2,000 uh, responses, 275 files, dedicated files. What does it mean? So usually those dedicated files or web, web pages are um, conclusions of discussions that the facilitator, once the discussion is closed, then if it's an important one and there is a potential for reuse of the information inside, then the facilitator is creating a dedicated page that is putting the conclusion of the discussion. Also, he, he can or she can put some uh, contextual information, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, so, so this is really a kind of a help for users, you know, to go through the the information that is there. You can also see the distribution of members by individual clusters. Currently, the winner is um, no, no, no. Just you know, by three members, it's the topographic and cadastral reference data cluster, so the Eurogeographic -ge community, we may say this. It's followed by Eurogeosurveys community, so geologists and, uh, let's say, earth scientists. So these are the biggest community that are, that are uh, providing members to, uh, to, this, to this activity. And also, in both cases, they also use their internal networks, so, so the information is shared also within their networks. So uh, the facilitators of those two clusters work as a kind of a bridge, bridging and bringing some information that is being debated inside those uh, European umbrella organizations. Okay. I just selected some most view content, just to give you an example, you know, what you can expect there. So for instance, the the cookbook on um, related how to set up the web services for geology was used almost was viewed almost 4,000 times. Also on the right side, or, or, yeah, right side, uh, you can see the topics and how many replies uh, you can get. So just for your information, what are the most uh, viewed and most replied topics? Okay, so since it's been a while that we started this activity and I think we, we matured a bit, we, we decided to, to take, a, take a minute and to, to evaluate whether you know, things are going okay, whether there are no different political requirements to the activity, whether you know, we can do things better. So we organized an evaluation workshop that took place in ISPRA and in March uh, this year, and as a as an input to the discussion, we also before the meeting we launched the open open uh, user satisfactory survey, so that we ask you about your opinion whether you think it's everything is fine, we should continue, or whether you see some some possibilities to improve. So we received roughly 130 responses, so it was a nice nice <clears throat> a nice number which we, um, of course, um, introduced during the discussion about, you know, where we, where we should go. If you want to see the results of the user survey and all the minutes of the meeting, it's available in the link that I provided in the, in the upper, in the down right corner. Okay. So, what were the conclusions? The, so regarding the structure, we agreed that we would extend the scope of, of nine clusters and we, we will add two cross-cutting clusters. So one dealing with software tools and services and other related to policy, policy uh, related uh, active, uh, policy related information. So this is partly, so the software tools is partly coming from you, from community, that in, for instance, if you want to know information how to set up GeoServer, it's a cross-cutting issue, so it's difficult to put it in one cluster. So therefore, you know, for these thematic, uh, for these uh, tools <clears throat> and services related to information, we, we, we are setting up a dedicated cluster. And the other one is a requirement from uh, DG Environment 
to kind of a, uh, bring closer the discussion to the official uh, multi-annual multi um, working plan of INSPIRE, for instance. And also to enable other policies, so like the other communities, like IONET, for instance, to publish their information inside the cluster, so to bridge, to bridge the, the possible gaps. Regarding the content, we, we, we will reorganize the, call, the content according to the tags. So this is very technical, so I think I, I, don't need to, I don't need to go really in detail, but the complete content of the clusters is going to be evaluated, or it has been evaluated already by the facilitators, and the new platform will be based on virtual views that will be using these control tags. And I will show you later a little demo of it. So, for the users, what is, what is important that the new users will automatically become uh, members of all clusters. So, you will not have to join the cluster as it is now. Um, you will be able to be notified by changes by selecting the tags that is, uh, that is um, relevant to your interest, to your needs. So, you will really be able to manage you know, what notification you will be, you will be getting. We are introducing something that is called featured outcomes. I already mentioned these dedicated pages, so you will be you will be guided to those uh, results resulting uh, pages immediately at the beginning of the of the platform. So the whole and last but not least, the whole um, let's say the, the software environment will be more intuitive, more uh, let's say discussion forum like uh, that is. Uh, as I said, you know, we started four years ago, so we felt that it's, we are a little bit out of date. So, th so the discussion forum-like uh, environment, uh, you know, you will see. Um, okay, so where we are exactly at this moment? So we are running now the beta version, and we are planning to launch it at the beginning of November. Um, I have just few slides how it looks like. So this is the landing page. And why I'm showing this is that there are four, there are four, we call it perspectives. As I said, the content now will be displayed by set of tags, set of you know, keywords that are attached to the information that is, that is there. And so for instance, this is a landing page for discussions related to software tools. You can see that you have the, you have the list of the discussion topics, files, or other types of information that we have. You have which cluster is, uh, it, is, uh, it is coming from, uh, which user uh, um, provided that information, and then you also see some statistics about how many views, how many replies. In case of the discussion topics, you will also see the status of the discussion, whether it's open or whether it's closed. <coughs> So for those who really know the platform, I think this is a completely different environment compared to how it is, how it is now, and we hope that it will, it will be much more intuitive. Um, this is another example. On the left side, you can see the map of the tags, and this is also a possibility for you to go directly by, by tag. So if you are, for instance, uh, interested in the GML solutions, then you will be able to click on that tag and you will get all the content that, is, that has been tagged by this, by this tag. Okay. As a user, you will be able to, of course, follow this guidance, so what we pre-cooked for you, but also you will have the option of the full text search as well, as well as the combination of tags. So you will be able to say, I want to see the good practices um, implementation good practices for soil and maybe another parameter. So, you know, you will be able to combine logical and logical or uh, for all these tags to get, to get the content that you are interested in. Okay? And basically, uh, this is it from my side. I, I'm always repeating this, uh, let's say, the common issue that we, we know from the beginning is that there is a fear for from the from the users to publish something on on the commission platform so you know from our sides please you know do not have this fear publish also uh, imperfect solution because this is really how the activity and how the platform can can continue be alive 
Okay, and that's it from my side. Um, any question, any suggestions? I have to thank you, you know, I don't know who of you have responded to this open survey. So thank you for, for your responses, that, that was very useful for the discussions. Overall, the, uh, the conclusions were that the activity should continue. It is very, very useful for, for you, for, for people that are, that are implementing. And, um, you know, the concrete proposals really, we, we tried to embed it in this proposal that I shortly presented to you. So if there is no question, then I will start with Stefania. <laughs> okay, I'm Stefania Morone, as you have heard. I'm, thank you. I'm the facilitator of the biodiversity and the area management cluster. And uh, here's the place where you can post your experiences, uh, your issues, your ideas. Uh, related to biodiversity domain and, uh, and management areas. So what's going on currently on the cluster? This is a screenshot that I took a couple of days ago. And this is the most uh, recent topics. So we have the reuse of inspired protected sites in the CDDA 2018 reporting from the European Environment Agency, but we will see this in the end. And the other question was related to best practice for code list extensions. That in, indeed, code list topics is recur recurrent one. That we have many, many uh, discussion on that. And I will take this as an example of what you can find in the cluster. So this is the discussion posted. And uh, uh, what, what can you find in our cluster? Possibly. Uh, a direct reply to your question, so a solution to your question, evaluation, and uh, suggestion to improve your um, data set, your example, and uh, or to deepen uh, your knowledge about that with the de dedicated pages, for example, on the cluster, like in this example, related to the area management and uh, also useful links and dedicated pages and also official documentation, authoritative documentations. And uh, in this case, for example, this was the, the discussion that was addressed uh, in the previous post. Uh, for example, here, there is, an, um, there is an example of how to use the specialized uh, zone type code list and where to find a useful and compliant extension of the code list. In this case, from ANET, so from the European Environment Agency. And uh, most, um, let's say, most views, most debated um, discussions, which had come to uh, somehow to a conclusion, I agreed conclusions, like in this case, have been briefly summarized at the end, and then a uh, dedicated page uh, will be created, sum summing um, the content and what has been agreed. In this case, for example, the, the original discussion is one of the most viewed, the most debated, the one with most replies, and I need two dedicated pages in this case. For example, I also used uh, an example on uh, usability of inspired data related to uh, pitfalls of a current software solution. In this case, not able to uh, fully um, consume uh, GML data. Or, or in this case, also, there is uh, an issue in the way the data is served. Uh, for more details, please register or view <laughs> the page and the thematic cluster. And uh, you will find also an uh, example of uh, um, view and download services, working ones. Uh, you will find also a brief description, so which is the software used, if this is conformant, fully conformant or not, where are the difficulties, and so on. And... Uh, Yes, one minute, I will. Uh, hot topic, 
one of the hottest topics uh, is about use of coverages in biodiversity areas, so species distributions and habitats and biotopes. And uh, we have, as, as you can see, many, many replies, interesting discussions, example files coming, and also, in the end, an encoding, how to encode your uh, coverage. And uh, last but not least, uh, hot topics, and you will hear many presentations here in, in the Inspire conference about that, uh, how to reuse Inspire data and Inspire data models, Inspire infrastructure, because Inspire is an infrastructure, so also metadata and so on. Uh, in this case, on CDDA um, reporting, 2018 reporting. So that's all from my side. Thank you very much. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Mirosław Migacz. I am the facilitator for the thematic cluster for statistics and health. Uh, this cluster comprises three inspired themes, statistical units, population distribution demography, and human health and safety. Uh, what's going on in the cluster right now? You can come to the cluster and see uh, information on ongoing developments in the field of statistics and health. Uh, for example, uh, the hot topic right now is the table joining services, which is being tested in uh, the Netherlands and Finland. Uh, this is a solution for on-the-fly merging of statistical data, for example, from population distribution team, with the geospatial data from statistical units team to produce maps based on statistical tables. You can also read about the ongoing Geostat projects, which uh, uh, are also a very interesting activity that has been going on for, for a few years now. Uh, the Geostat projects uh, produced uh, data sets and frameworks for georeferent statistics. Uh, for example, uh, one of the, I think, most renowned results of the Geostat projects uh, is the standardized population grid for Europe, uh, which includes 31 countries from the EU, EFTA, and uh, Kosovo and Albania. It's a uniform population grid with this in, in the same uh, coordinate system for whole of Europe. So it's quite quite an achievement, I think. Uh, you can also learn about uh, events, which are conferences, workshops, and webinars that uh, are in the field of the cluster. Uh, you can come to the cluster to learn how to implement Inspire. You can download uh, ready-made compliant GML examples. You can read discussions on how to implement. Uh, and you can talk with experts, because uh, experts that are involved in Inspire implementation in national statistical institutes are uh, frequently uh, coming to the cluster and sharing their experiences. If you think there's something wrong, or if you have a problem, uh, with the model, the schemas, uh, some software tools or implementation, let us know. We have some issues that have already been solved. Uh, there were, uh, for example, wrong data types in the specifications, some typos, uh, some code list issues, those were corrected already. There are some larger issues that are still pending, but the processing is ongoing. This includes the usability of the population distribution model. Uh, or alternative methods for uh, demography data uh, provision for Inspire. You might think you're not in a hurry, because uh, all the teams within the statistical cluster are uh, in the Annex 3, but the Annex 3 deadline is in two years, so it's not that far away. Uh, many countries have already started their implementation efforts, some already are posted on the cluster, Come to the cluster, see how they are doing, and most importantly, uh, if you started your implementation, doesn't matter on which level of advancement it is, please come and share your experiences. It will be very helpful for others, and uh, you might find some answers and solutions for yourself uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm Jordi Scriu, facilitator of the thematic cluster on elevation uh, orthoimagery, uh, coordinate reference systems, and geographical grids. And I will try to show you a kind of uh, uh, overview of the topics we, we are uh, working in the cluster. 
So uh, first of all, uh, the main objective of, of uh, any of the cluster, no, not especially my, my, my cluster, is to help you in order to uh, implement. So uh, it's important to, to get uh, all your experience, your activity, uh, all your efforts uh, uh, in this platform in order to uh, um, get an, a general overview of the problems and, and try to solve them uh, in, in collaboration. So uh, I just give one example of a discussion topic, which uh, I think is quite uh, important in, in, in this cluster, which is, uh, as, as you know, uh, elevation and ortho imagery is uh, uh, mostly provided uh, under the INSPIRE directive using the, the web coverage services. So they are coverages, which is a kind of a special raster data format which uh, is powerful in the sense that uh, then we can combine data, raster data from different themes and make some uh, overlays with, with all this data. So uh, uh, this is a very important topic in, in my cluster, so I, I took um, that example. And uh, in this case, this was a question for, for, from Lars uh, Storgard. Okay, uh, uh, it was a question regarding the, the technical guidelines on WCS uh, services, web coverage services, and uh, it was just a general question about interpretation of the technical guideline, pro but uh, at the end, uh, the, the, the things that are involved in, in, in one uh, discussion topic it's, are also related to many of the different discussions that are in the, in the cluster. So, uh, uh, and in this case, uh, everything is related so, uh, uh, to those specific issues that uh, have been also involved in the cluster regarding uh, coverages. We have uh, here some, some, some uh, highlights about the potential of the WCS service that uh, some communities are not uh, totally aware of, of that power. Uh, terminology issues, uh, coverage encoding, uh, how to map the INSPIRE properties that are considered in the INSPIRE models in, uh, within the, the implementation standards, uh, um, mostly coming from OGC, and also uh, to, um, trying to provide some clues to, for uh, better service efficiency. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, all these discussion topics are uh, more or less uh, analyzed by, by the facilitators, integrated when, when there is a kind of uh, outcome from the discussion, integrated in pages, etc. And uh, all this uh, help us to uh, document uh, all, uh, all, all these materials in, in, in our activities. You have here a page where uh, you can access to the different activities we have developed in the, in the platform in the cluster, uh, and uh, this is an example of them, a webinar uh, about uh, how to implement these uh, coverages. Uh, uh, there is uh, plenty of information in that pages where with uh, access to, to the different uh, elements which are uploaded to the platform and you can use it as, as a reference material for, for your work. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, after that, uh, the important thing is to, to, to draft some results from, from our activity. Uh, this will be included in the future outcomes uh, perspective of the new platform that uh, Robert has, has uh, announced in the first presentation. Uh, so uh, this can be done, as, uh, as Stefania said, in, in, in pages, dedicated pages, where we provide our our overview of, of the discussions, of the, of the uh, solutions that, that we, we have uh, found uh, to, to your problems. Uh, there are also encoding examples uh, that are available for you, and it's important to, to take into account that maybe this, these examples are, are not perfect, but uh, if, if we don't have uh, even an imperfect example, uh, so the problem is uh, who is providing the, the, the final one. So it's important that you share your, 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 ex your experiences and, and, and your results during your implementation effort. Uh, 
apart from that, uh, what we are achieving uh, is trying to gather the first experiences uh, regarding the implementation of uh, WGCS services. So, uh, and this is also uh, included in the platform and, and, and provided to you. And just at the end, uh, I would be willing to invite you to, to the workshop that we will be having uh, tomorrow morning at nine o'clock in room Nightingale, where we uh, will be continuing our discussion on INSPER coverages, also with the work we have done uh, with Cathy Slate from the observational cluster. And I, I would be really proud to have you on board. Uh, th thank you very much. It's 39, not 90. Okay, it's... Oh. Excuse me, <laughs> nine o'clock. <laughs>
So it's getting more and more to how do we really structure our things, our environmental monitoring facilities, how do we get the data aligned. And one of the things which has come up has been a, a preconception that, for example, the, the oceanographic features and the atmospheric conditions both utilize the observational model. So I mean, I'm very familiar with them. But then people will say, okay, well, I'm done. I have my oceanographic data online. And they don't realize that by putting the data online, they've basically proven they have an environmental monitoring facility because this data did not magically appear in their database. And therefore, any of you responsible for oceanographic or atmospheric data or anything falling into the O&M bit, do think about where has this data come from and the fact that you should probably try and encode the EF for it also, which once you've got the measurements online, that's a tricky bit anyway. Ad adding the EF is a, a little tiny bit, but it needs to be done. So I mean, that, that's one sort of meta bit. Um, other topics which have been coming up. Uh, Jordi has mentioned a bit of the, the things with coverage issues. This comes up because many of the observation types we have actually as a result provide a coverage not in the classical ortho imagery, satellite imagery uh, concept, but we use this for things like for measurement profiles in the ocean or also atmospheric profiles. So it's a one dimensional coverage going up or down. And there's been a great deal of confusion. How is this really to be encoded? There's a lot of unclarity in how these data models were really specified. And we've been doing our best to put good practice documents out there. So the one thing is if, if you are going at this, at the very start of the observation cluster, you have a good practice page. There are piles of different GML files from various environmental domains. Look through those. That'll give you quite a bit of help of how to get there. And also, if you're encoding anything with observational data, Try and find the D 2.9 guidelines. I have it linked from my bits. It's a bit hard to find right now. It was made as the basis for how do we define these, these observation-based Inspire models. But there's a lot of valuable information in there, what this observation thingy really is and how it's to be used. And so before you really go at encoding this, I would recommend go through D9, go through the nice examples we've done, and then you might see a bit clearer. And as a further step, I would also recommend actually post your best guess how to structure this on the cluster and see what feedback you get. Because it, it's tricky to understand, especially with this observational bit, what is your feature of interest? What are you really measuring? This is something that most people intuitively get wrong. I mean, I had a beautiful example last week of somebody saying they're measuring the, the noise made by a windmill. The feature of interest is the windmill. No, it's the location where you have made the noise measurement. Because if I'm measuring the noise at three places around the, the windmill, relevant is where was it measured, then I can figure out where is the, the windmill in comparison, then I can figure out how loud is the windmill. But th these are the tricky bits where people intuitively get lost, throw it at the cluster, you'll get an answer fairly quickly. So that, that's one part of it. What other things have been happening? A note of warning. There, there are various glitches, A, in the coverage bits, in the results. There are also some issues with the non-coverage results. The, the one schema for time series, we've got a time location value pair. You've got the time and the location covered, no value which is really what you're trying to communicate. So be, beware of the fact there's a list of open issues. We need to get these thematized and sorted. I've been doing my best from the facilitator perspective, but I mean, here's a, re a strong request to everybody out there. The more people say, yes, this is a problem, I also have this problem, the more likely we are to get some sort of resolution on this. Because as long as it's me saying they all have a problem, you all have a problem, it's my problem, but it's, I'm. I'm not the problem, you're the problem. So, so please make your problems clear and then we can de-problemize them. <laughs> um, okay, to, to, to stop this on a, on a, on a happy note again, um, we do have some cool stuff coming up. I'm not sure if I've mentioned this on the cluster yet or not, but if not, it will be there by tomorrow, that we are going a lot towards simplified encoding. 
we've been exploring, there's a new OGC standard for the provision of sensor information. It's called Sensor Things. It is absolutely beautiful. I, I am in love. It is a, a, a restful standard. It is JSON encoded. It is so beautiful to work with. Our record, we did at a hackathon last fall. We had four hours. I got the data online in four hours, and a friend of mine who had never seen this had a viewer running. So this is where we're going. So it, we, we are making your lives easier. Look at the cluster, and you might find interesting things on it. Thank you very much. Hi. So I'm Kieran Millard. I'm a facilitator of the uh, Marine and Atmosphere Cluster, which basically does everything that moves around. And uh, you can't even see it, but sometimes you can touch it. Um, what I wanted to talk about is a little bit of work we did with uh, TG Data and the European Environment Agency at the beginning of the year, all about marine litter and what you do with it and what we looked at it on the cluster and the issues that came up and the practical sort of solutions. So I kind of like this because this is really, um, since we actually wrote the uh, Sea Regions data specification many, many years ago, this is actually one of the really nice concrete use cases that we've, that we've got out of this. And it's quite nice to illustrate some of the points. So everyone wants to look at rubbish, very interesting thing. So let's just, just remind us about sort of Sea Regions as one of these four parts of the clusters. First of all, it's looking at features of the marine environment as opposed to coverages, and it is defined by physical and chemical characteristics. So these are the two guiding rules that are written in the legislation, which actually defines the underlying sort of like data specifications. But to sort of like cut to the chase, if you've got marine litter, it actually can be determined as a physical characteristics of the ocean. So you could effectively segment your ocean according to the density of rubbish that it's got in there. So in theory, if you've got a marine litter data set, you could actually represent it as AC regions. So, question, how can you go about doing that with some of the data sets that already exist? So, if you are looking at rubbish, you need to decide which of the Inspire specifications there are. And I think this alludes to what sort of like Cathy was saying earlier, depending on what your viewpoint is, there's different ways of doing it. So simply, if you're focus is the marine environment, and the marine litter is a property of that, then you see regions. If you have a numeric data set and that's your focus of interest, then probably oceanographic ge fe or geographic features is the best case. But if you actually want to describe the process of how you go about and sample the environment for marine litter and have the results of that, then you're describing a process, so therefore it's environmental monitoring facilities. So, you have got a choice here about what's important to you in terms of which specification you use. So, let's have a look at some real rubbish. The OSPAR marine litter data set. <laughs> um, so, this is what you get if you look at OSPAR. This is how marine litter is represented. It's that little red dot just in Northern Ireland, and you've got lots of attributes towards it. So that starts to indicate to you what you can and can't do with that litter if you want data set, if you want to try and make it inspire compliance. So question one is, could you actually use that as a shoreline? Sure, we can take the shoreline, we can break it up into different places, and you could segment that according to how much litter you've got. But you have no real-world geometry of your beach, so therefore you can't use the sea regions in this characteristic. The second point is, is if you could, you would have to extend the shoreline feature type because it only allows two types of segmentation at the moment, one for coastal stability and one for shoreline type, based on what was originally put in the Corrin Coastal Erosion Database. So we could extend it, but probably a better way of doing it is to start to use the shoreline data set as a sampling feature linked to the environmental monitoring facilities. So if this exists, you could say, I'm measuring marine litter and point to where it exists in the real world. So similarly, could I use the intertidal area feature type? Well, again, you've got the same problems. Great, you can imagine this from a data set. If you've got a big intertidal area and you want to look at litter distribution over it, absolutely sort of like fantastic. But if your data set is just a little point at some random location on the beach, of course you can't. But again, we can start to look at how this data set could be used linked with a environmental monitoring facilities data set. So it's not worth extending, I don't think, the Sea Regions data set 
it, an entitled data, entitled area data set just to have attribution, which you can't currently have. So again, we should be using this as a sampling feature with other Inspire themes. And this starts to look at really where Inspire starts to get uh, really powerful is these linkages across and between the different themes. Of course, in OSPAR, there's two different types of litter. There's litter on the beach and there's litter on the sea. So litter at the sea looks like this. It's kind of a quasi sort of like uh, sparse grid. But again, it's largely just a point in a grid with lots of attributes that defines the different ways that sort of like litter is looked at. Now, again, you could potentially put this as, uh, as a, some kind of coverage data set. But if you really wanted to, you could look at this in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, one of the sea regions data sets, and that's marine contour. And what we actually did, we actually took this data set, we ran it through hail to convert it to uh, marine contour, and you end up with something like this, which probably looks a little bit sort of prettier, but it also highlights the fact you've got these different use cases of where you might want to use the data. You would imagine a data set like this, maybe in a marine atlas, or maybe in a report, or background contextual mapping to other data sets for spatial querying. So for example, find the populations of species X, where litter is within this area. Uh, whereas this sort of data set, you might actually be using it as a source data set for further downstream analysis. So the question is really, what does this actually mean in practice? Well, simply, sea regions is really the best theme is where you're the underlying geometry in your data set represents the real world. Um, you can attribute the, um, the sea regions, but to have some properties of the real world, but it's probably better off using this data specifications as a reference for other themes linked to de detailed measurements, such as EF, for example. Um, and really, in, in conclusion, it's you can use sea regions for marine litter, but whether it's the best option really depends on what you as the user are actually trying to do with the data. Thank you. Okay, good af afternoon everyone. I'm Lena Halim Bihlate from the Finnish Environment Institute and I act as the facilitator of the land cover and land use cluster. And I must say it has been a pleasure to follow this session. I have so fantastic colleagues to work with in this. The outline of my presentation, well I will highlight some contents on the cluster and then I will give you an insight in some recent events, events that have taken place since the last INSPIRE conference. So as coming to contents, there are some examples of, of uh, view and download services providing data sets within land cover and land use themes that I would like to draw your attention to. So go and have a look at the dedicated page. And there are also some encoding examples of the, these three application schemas. So if you are starting to work with these themes, please go and have a look. And then coming to, to the first event that took place in, in mid-November last year. Um, it was organized by, by myself as a, the facilitator of the land cover and land use cluster together with Inspire Ken. Eurographics, um, EuroSDR, and uh, EEA, the European Environment Agency. And this event uh, brought together researchers, INET people, um, people from the National Land Mapping Agencies, and Copernicus people, and it was a really, for me, useful event, and I think it was useful for all of us to have a full day time to, to with presentation and to discuss issues. And uh, there's a link from the cluster to, to the, all the presentations and, and the summary of the event, the summary of the discussions of the event. The, the, the link is also provided to you here. And the next day there was uh, uh, an event, so-called Copernicus CLC Plus, user consultation organized by, by DG Grow. And, and I would say all of us took play, uh, participated in, in both events. It was an open event where we discussed where we are with the land cover information in Europe at the moment. And uh, when developing it further uh, for C CLC Plus, where, which 
approach should we take? And, and it was an opportunity for countries to give feedback to, to DG Grow. And uh, I would like to highlight a couple of workshop findings here. There is a clear trend for so separation of, of the land use and land, use, land cover concepts. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> land cover and land use. So, um, uh, using different technical solutions. So, there were examples from countries where they were maintained or development projects where they are maintaining, trying to maintain them as separate product, products, or then going in for a solution where you have the same product with, with two, two different layers, sharing the same geometry and update cycle. So to the same um, geometry, you could either link land cover or land use information. And this, uh, yeah, there was a clear, it, due to technical reason, due to inspire. So there were several reasons why, why countries had choose, chosen to, to, to do this in this way. And there uh, was a clear support for the revision of an ISIS standard called the land cover meta language in order to meet the needs of INSPIRE and also to, to align with uh, something that is called the EAGLE concept, to be able to differentiate between land cover and land use, to link from one uh, geometrical object both to land cover in, uh, information and land use information. And uh, what uh, are then the needs of INSPIRE? Well, <laughs> It has been recognized and it has been put on the, English, on the thematic cluster that there is a need for, for this ISO standard schema to point on from this uh, attribute in the red box. Well, why? Because uh, we cannot validate it. We have to know what's, how to structure the GML in order to, to be according to this standard and, and it's not has there hasn't been a schema available so far. In order to really be able to compare and reuse the, the class definitions in a machine readable way. And also as there's the need to better link land use and land cover information. That comes me to the second and, and event and my last slide. In May, uh, I participated in, in, in an ISO standard meeting in Copenhagen, where there was a dedicated workshop on land cover issues, where uh, global needs, inspire needs, and eagle opportunities were brought forward, issues related to an update to, to this LCML standard. And it was then decided at the plenary that the Project Zero invitation will be sent out by, by the UN Food and Agriculture in, um, Organization. And after that Project Zero, then a revision of, of that standard will take place. And now I'm happy to an announce that last week, uh, since last week it has been possible to, that there's a call out for participants in this activity, in this pro Project Zero. Event and I will post something about this on, on the, the thematic platform, the thematic cluster. So please, if you are invited, you can either contact me or then um, be in contact with your national standardization body if you want to be appointed and be part of this work. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Uh, my name is Amelia Bapti. Uh, I'm the facilitator for the Earth Science Cluster. Uh, I work for the British Geological Survey, but in this role I represent the Spatial Information Expert Group of the Euro Geo Surveys. And I can see some of my colleagues in the audience. Um, so the Earth Science theme, we, we cover five Inspire themes, one Annex 2, which is geology, four themes which are Annex 3. 
Uh, as I said, we had 218 members, uh, a lot from the Eurogeo surveys and other research institutes uh, relating to earth science data. Traditionally, a lot of our activity on the cluster has been within the geology and the mineral uh, cluster communities, but that is changing, and, and we'll, uh, we'll just talk about some of that here. So within this presentation, I just want to talk about some of the projects that our community members are actually, where they're using the data specifications and testing them and identifying where they want changes made and then pushing changes uh, to the cluster. Okay, so I'm just going to take you off cluster very quickly. Uh, so these are just some of the examples of projects that are ongoing within the earth science community. So we have EPOS, which is the European Plate Observing System Project. This is where we're setting up a virtual research infrastructure uh, across Europe uh, for solid earth science. So we're joining up something called DDSS, which are data sets, uh, 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 data products, software and services. And they're coming from a number of scientific communities across Europe. So geomagnetism, seismology, geology, uh, and just to name some of the communities. So that's in its implementation phase at the moment and should be kind of operational within 2020. So we have EGDI, which you might have heard of, it's the European Geological Data Infrastructure. It's a central portal within Europe where we want to make a sort of central portal for, for uh, geological information within Europe. Some data, set, data sets, for example, geological maps are available, but again, there's lots and lots of work ongoing to join up other data sets and make those available through this portal. GeoERA is another one. Uh, we're, we're collecting data on geoenergy, groundwater, raw materials. And again, that will be, all that data will be developed and then made available through the information platform, which may be part of EGDI, but I won't say any more on that for now. And the last one, uh, just as an example, is the One Geology Project, which I think has been mentioned at the sort of Inspire conferences. Uh, and the sort of aim of that is to bring together worldwide geological and geoscience data sets. So again, I mention these because this is all the kind of work that our community is involved with, where they're testing the data specifications and, and coming up with changes. So I'm going to quickly go through each, each one, and this takes six minutes, so I'll have to talk fast. So geology is quite an active community, and there's quite a lot of discussions and sort of change requests coming out of the geology theme. Uh, for example, there's a discussion on 3D geological models, and this has always been a kind of challenge to, to publish these and share these for uh, GIS specialists and earth scientists. But there are discussions, for example, going on in the cluster of how best to do this and how Inspire can support this, and a test application is there to kind of promote discussion. Uh, empty code lists, again, is something else that comes up quite regularly. Uh, for example, within geophysics, and there's, again, discussion ongoing about how they can, the, the community can, for example, within the GeoERA project, agree to, to po and, and populate these uh, going forward. So again, lots and lots of change requests coming out of, of the geology theme, upgrading the kind of uh, data uh, standards that they want to work with. Uh, EPOS, for example, are working directly with the, geolog uh, with the geology data specifications and boreholes, and they've identified a number of changes that they'd like to make to the styling and to the code lists. Typographical errors often come up, and we often ask for those to be changed in the registry, and changes to the schema, for example, within geophysics. Okay, soil. There's kind of a lot of discussions on the code list and the implementation of the, of the data model. Uh, the kind of changes that are coming out, and I really like these ones because they're, they're really practical. So people have been trying to, to use the data specifications and they're identifying where there are problems. So for example, with the XSD, uh, I think there's missing associations within there. And we've asked JRC to sort of update that, that shortly. Just to just a, a, you know, point that one out. And then in other places, we're noticing where people are trying to model their data. So for example, people are trying to model their data that's the bottom one. Um, and they're, they're using subsoil, but they're realizing they also want to be able to model what's above. So extend the code, code list to in, include sort of the hummus layer on top and, and what's below the subsoil. And again, I, just, I like that because it's a very practical example of, of the way people are trying to, to use the specifications and how they want them to change to work for them. OK, so mineral resources. Kind of discussions that are ongoing is using earth resource markup language for, for, those, for those layers. The kind of change requests that they're not coming out at the moment, but there's a lot of work going on within the One Geology project and how to use ERML. And they're saying that Yoni, one of my colleagues, gave a presentation on this uh, just yesterday. But one of the things that will probably come out of that is, is using a new uh, global ERML light standard uh, going forward. So that's something that will hopefully come out in the future. 
Okay. Natural risk zones, it's been sort of quite a low activity so far in this cluster, but we kind of expect that to change a bit going forward. Uh, just speaking again, there's some sort of test data sets, for example, within Italy. Uh, they've got landslides and, and flood zones, and we expect to be able to share that kind of information shortly. And again, we expect to kind of create an active vault there from the GeoERA project. And again, we'd like to really kind of use this opportunity to, if you are using these data specifications and you have experience you'd like to share, uh, please do get involved with the cluster. And again, I'm going to say that point again for energy resources because we have very sort of little activity there at the moment. Uh, so again, if you are using those data specifications, please do uh, get involved or, or point us to the right people that we might want to engage. And that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>